Welcome to the fourth part of our cybersecurity series. Today, we are diving into how to manage security risks. In a world full of cyber threats, risks and vulnerabilities, one wrong move can lead to huge financial losses, damaged reputations, or even worse. But don't worry, we are here to arm you with the tools and knowledge to manage these risks effectively. You will start by understanding what threats, risks, and vulnerabilities are and why they matter. Then, we will talk about the real-world impacts they can have. Finally, we will explore practical strategies and tools, including the NIST Risk Management Framework, Cyber Security Framework, and modern tools like SIEM and SOAR to help keep your assets secure. Ready to take control of your cybersecurity? Let's dive in. So let's talk about threats. What is a threat? A threat is any circumstance or event that has the potential to harm an organization's assets. Think of it as an external or internal force that could negatively impact data, systems, or people. One example of threat is phishing attack, which is a situation whereby threat actors trick employees into revealing sensitive information through deceptive emails. Next, let's talk about risks. A risk with the potential for a threat to exploit a vulnerability, leading to a negative impact. Think of it as the likelihood a harmful event occurring combined with the severity of its consequences. An example of a risk for an organization might be the lack of backup protocols for making sure its stored information can be recovered in the event of an incident or security incident. Organizations tend to rate risks at different levels, low, high, and medium depending on possible threats and the value of an asset. A low-risk asset is information that will not harm the organization's reputation or ongoing operations and will not cause financial damage if compromised. This includes public information such as website content or published research data. A medium-risk asset might include information that is not available to the public and may cause some damage to the organization's finances, reputation, or ongoing operations. For example, the early release of a company's quarterly earnings will impact the value of their stock. While a high-risk asset is any information protected by regulations or laws, which if compromised would have a severe negative impact on an organization's finances, ongoing operations, or reputation. This could include leaked assets with SPII, PII, or intellectual property. Let's talk about vulnerability. A vulnerability is a weakness in a system, process, or policy that can be exploited by a threat to cause harm. These are often entry points that allow risks to materialize. Examples of vulnerabilities include an outdated firewall, software, or application, weak passwords, or unprotected confidential data. People can also be considered vulnerable. Let's talk about the impact of threat, risks, and vulnerability to an organization or asset. The first impact is ransomware. A ransomware is a malicious attack where threat actors encrypt an organization's data and then demand for payment to restore access. Once ransomware is deployed by an attacker, it can freeze network systems, leave devices unusable, and encrypt or lock confidential data, making devices inaccessible. The threat actor then demands a ransom for providing a decryption key to allow organizations to return to their normal business operations. The next impact is financial impact. When an organization's assets are compromised by an attack, such as the use of malware, the financial consequences can be significant for a variety of reasons. This can include interrupted production and services, the cost to correct the issue, and fines if assets are compromised because of the non-compliance with laws and regulations. The last impact is identity theft. Organizations must decide whether to store private customer, employee, and outside vendor data, or for how long. Storing any type of sensitive data presents a risk to the organization. Sensitive data includes sensitive personal identifiable information, or SPII, which can be sold or leaked through the dark web. That's because the dark web provides a sense of secrecy and threat actors may have the ability to sell the data jail without facing legal consequences. Next, let's talk about how we can manage risks. The primary goal of organizations is to protect assets. Assets can be digital or physical. Example of digital assets include personal information of employees, clients, or vendors, such as servers, offices, date of birth, bank account numbers. Some common strategies used to manage risks include acceptance. Sometimes, the best course of action is to accept the risks, especially if the likelihood of the threat is low 
or the cost of mitigating the risks is higher than the potential loss. This approach involves acknowledging the risks and continuing with business activities without taking significant action. However, this decision should be regularly revisited to ensure the risks remain acceptable. For example, a company might accept the risks of a minor data breach from public information available on their website as it is unlikely to lead to significant harm. Another way that we can manage risks is through avoidance. Risk avoidance involves altering business practices to eliminate the risks altogether. If a risk is deemed too dangerous, an organization may change its processes, technologies, or business strategies to avoid it. For example, a company decides to stop using a particular software that has a known vulnerability, opting for a more secure alternative to avoid exposure to cyber attacks. The next way we can manage risks is through transferring. Transferring risks involves shifting the responsibility to another party, typically through insurance or outsourcing certain services to vendors or third parties who specialize in risk management. For example, an organization may buy insurance to protect against the financial impact of data breach or hire a managed security services provider to handle their cyber security. This is the most common approach and involves implementing controls and safeguards. For example, an organization implements multi-factor authentication to mitigate the risks of unauthorized access to sensitive data. Next, let's discuss the NIFT Risk Management Framework. The NIFT Risk Management Framework is one of the most widely used frameworks for managing security risks. It provides a structured, systematic approach to identifying, assessing, and controlling risks. Here are the seven steps in the NIFT Risk Management Framework. First step is prepare. This step involves activities necessary to manage security and privacy risks before a breach occurs. As an entry-level analyst, you are likely to use this step to monitor risks and identify controls for risk reduction. The next step is categorize. This step is where risk management processes and tasks are developed by considering the impact of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems and information. As an entry-level analyst, understanding how to follow these processes is crucial, especially in reducing risks to critical assets like private customer information. The next step is select. This step involves choosing, customizing, and documenting controls that protect the organization. This step may include keeping playbooks up to date or managing documentation to address issues more efficiently. The next step is implement. This step focuses on implementing security and privacy plans for the organization. Having effective plans is essential for minimizing the impact of ongoing security risks. For example, addressing a pattern of customer password research by implementing changes to password requirements. Next step is assess. This means determining if established controls are implemented correctly. Analysts take the time to analyze whether protocols, procedures, and controls in place meet organizational needs identifying potential weaknesses and proposing changes if necessary. The next step is authorize. This step involves being accountable for security and privacy risks. Analysts may generate reports, develop plans of action, and establish project milestones aligned with the organization's security goals. And the last step is monitor. This step requires being aware of how systems are operating. Analysts assess and maintain technical appropriations daily, ensuring that the current system supports the organization's security goals. If not, changes may be needed. While it might not be our responsibility to establish these procedures, we will need to ensure they are working as intended. Minimizing risks to the organization and the people it serves. Next, let's discuss the NIFT Cybersecurity Framework Functions. The NIFT Cybersecurity Framework Functions, or the NIFT CSF, focuses on five core functions. They include identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. These functions help organizations manage cybersecurity risks, implement risk management strategies, and learn from previous mistakes. Let's look at each of these steps or functions. The first function, which is identify, involves managing cybersecurity risks and the impact on an organization's people and assets. As a cybersecurity analyst, you might monitor internal network systems to identify potential security issues. The next function is protect. This function aims to protect an organization through the implementation of policies, procedures, training, and tools. As an analyst, studying historical data and improving policies and procedures is essential in dealing with new threats. 
The next function is detect. This function involves identifying potential security incidents and enhancing monitoring capabilities for faster and more efficient detections. Analysts may review new security tool setups to ensure the flag and alert the team about potential threats or incidents. The next function is response. This function ensures proper procedures are used to contain, neutralize, and analyze security incidents. Analysts may work with a team to collect and organize data, document incidents, and suggest improvement to prevent the occurrence. And the last function, which is recover, involves returning affected systems back to normal operation. Analysts may work with their teams to restore systems, data, and assets affected by incidents like bridges. From proactive to reactive measures, all five functions are essential for ensuring effective security strategies in an organization. Next, let's discuss the Open Web Application Security Project, also known as OAP Security Principles. In the workplace, security principles are embedded in your daily tasks. Whether you're analyzing logs, monitoring the system information and event management dashboard, or using vulnerability scanners, we will use these principles in some way. The principles include first, the principle of least privilege, which says that users must have the least amount of access required to perform their everyday tasks. The next principle is minimize attack surface area. Attack surface area refers to all potential vulnerabilities a threat actor could exploit. The next principle is defense in depth. It says that every organization will have varying security controls that mitigate risks and threats. Next principle is separation of duties. Critical actions should rely on multiple people, each of whom follow the principle of least privilege. And lastly, keep security simple. Avoid unnecessarily complicated solutions. Complexity makes security difficult. Next, let's discuss security controls. Controls are used alongside frameworks to reduce the possibility and impact of a security threat risks of vulnerability. Controls can be physical, technical, and administrative, and are typically used to prevent, detect, or correct security issues. Examples of physical controls include gates, fences, and locks, security guards, closed circuit television, also known as CCTV camera, and motion detectors. Examples of technical controls include firewalls, multi-factor authentication, also known as MFA, and antivirus software. Examples of administrative controls include separation of duties, authorization, and asset classification. Next, let's discuss security audits. A security audit is a review of an organization's security controls, policies, and procedures against a set of expectations. Audits are independent reviews that evaluate whether an organization is meeting internal and external criteria. Internal criteria include outlined policies, procedures, and best practices. External criteria include regulatory compliance, laws, and federal regulations. Let's talk about the goals and objectives of an audit. The goal of an audit is to ensure organizations' information technology practices are meeting industry and organizational standards. The objective is to identify and address areas of remediation and growth. Audits provide direction and clarity and identifying what the current failures are and developing a plan to correct them. Security audits must be performed to safeguard data and avoid penalties and fines from governmental agencies. The frequency of audits is dependent on local laws and federal compliance regulations. Let's talk about the role of frameworks and controls in audits. Along with compliance, it's important to mention the role of frameworks and controls in security audits. Frameworks such as the National Institute of Standards and Technology Cyber Security Framework and the International Standard for Information Security, also known as the ISO series, are designed to help organizations prepare for regulatory compliance security audits. By adhering to these and other relevant frameworks, organizations can save time when conducting external and internal audits. Let's talk about the audit checklist. It is necessary to create an audit checklist before conducting an audit. A checklist is generally made up of the following areas of focus. The first is to identify the scope of the audit. The audit should leave assets that will be assessed. Examples like firewalls are configured correctly. PII is secure. Fiscal assets are locked. Indicate how often an audit should be performed. Include an evaluation of organizational policies, protocols, and procedures 
to make sure they are working as intended and being implemented by employees. The next step in the audit checklist is complete a risk assessment. A risk assessment is used to evaluate and identify organizational risks related to budget, control, internal processes, and external standards. After you perform the risk assessment, the next step is to conduct an audit. When conducting an internal audit, you will access the security of the identified asset listed in the audit scope. After conducting the audit, the next step is to create a mitigation plan. A mitigation plan is a strategy established to lower the level of risks and potential costs, penalties, or other issues that can negatively affect the organization's security posture. And the last step in the checklist is to communicate the results to the stakeholder. The result of this process is providing a detailed report of findings, suggested improvements needed to lower the organization's level of risk and compliance regulations and standards the organization's needs to adhere to. Next, let's talk about other cybersecurity tools that can be used to manage risk. The first is the SIM tool, which stands for Security Information and Event Management, also pronounced as SIM. SIM tool is used to collect and analyze log data to monitor critical activities. A log is a record of events within an organization's systems and network. Common log source include firewall logs, network logs, and server logs. Monitoring logs help security teams to identify vulnerabilities and potential data breaches. Team 2 provides real-time visibility, event monitoring, analysis, automated alerts, and centralized log data storage. Team 2 index and minimize the numbers of logs manually review, increasing efficiency and saving time. Configuration and customization of SIM tools are essential to meet each organization's unique security needs. The next tool we have is Playbooks. A playbook is a manual that provides details about operational action. Essentially, a playbook provides a predefined and up-to-date list of steps to perform when responding to an incident. Playbooks are accompanied by a strategy. The strategy outlines expectations of team members who are assigned a task and some playbook also lists the individuals responsible. The outline expectations are accompanied by a plan. Let's talk about the types of playbooks. We have two types of playbooks, the incident and vulnerability playbook. These two types of playbooks are similar in that both contain predefined and up-to-date list of steps to perform when responding to an incident. Following this step is necessary to ensure that you as a cybersecurity professional are adhering to legal and organizational standards and protocols. These playbooks also help minimize errors and ensure that important actions are performed within specific time frames. Common steps included in the incident and vulnerability playbooks include preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery from an incident. The next tool is the SOAR tool, which stands for Security Orchestration, Automation, and Re category of tools used in cybersecurity to help organizations manage and respond to security threats more effectively. SOAR tools help streamline, automate, and improve the incident response process. Think of it as a smart assistant for cybersecurity that takes care of routine tasks, organizes security workflows, and responds to threats quickly. Next, let's look at how playbooks, team tools, and SOAR tools can be used together. Playbooks are used by cybersecurity teams in event of an incident. Playbooks help security teams respond to incident by ensuring that a consistent list of actions are followed in a prescribed way, regardless of who is working on the case. Playbooks can be very detailed and may include flowcharts and tables to clarify what actions to take in which order. Playbooks are generally used alongside team tools if, for example, unusual behavior is flagged by a SIM tool. A playbook provides analysts with instructions about how to address the issue. Playbooks are also used with SOAR tools. SOAR tools are like SIM tools in that they are used for threat monitoring. SOAR is a piece of software used to automate repetitive tasks generated by tools such as SIM or manage detection and response. For example, if a user attempts to log into their computer too many times with the wrong password, a SOAR will automatically block their account stop a possible intrusion. Then, analysts will refer to a playbook to take steps to resolve the issue. Thank you for joining us. Once again, my name is Tochi Dennis. In our next class, we'll be talking about network and network security. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.